is it the right of students and parents to know about the performance of their teachers outweigh the reasonable expectation of privacy that teachers have to not have their names in the newspaper. So we decided that it was important to make this information public, but that if we're going to do so, we needed to do so very carefully in a way that gave the proper context to the information and in a way that um, kind of directed the conversation towards the most productive use of the information. And so that's what we tried to do. We said, yes, ultimately, the, the parents and the students' interest outweighs that of the, the teachers. Um, but we need to be responsible in how we do this. And so we invested months of work in just figuring out the right way uh, to, to communicate this. And you know, as Doug suggested, we're still, you know, based on feedback we've gotten, we're still kind of, you know, look, we're going to be rolling out some additional data soon. We're still kind of thinking about these issues and messing with them. <coughs> this series is also, also examines, as the headline here says, uh, value added. Um, and it's, it's a new trend that's emerging in states in terms of how different states are judging teachers. Jason, can you talk a little bit about what value added means? Sure. And, um, um, it's a tool that's been around for a while, um, probably since the 70s. It was developed as like uh, a conference thing. Um, and so states like Tennessee have used it for decades. And the way it basically works, and this is a nutshell um, synopsis, but it uses uh, standardized tests, the students perform in a standardized test to estimate how effective a teacher is in raising those scores. And so it's using that student's past performance to estimate how well they'll do in the future. So if you score in the 60th percentile, let's just say in like third grade, you expect to score in that general area. Um, in fourth grade, and if there's a big swing either up and down, let's say you pop up to the 80th percentile, drop down to the 40th percentile, um, that is like the quote unquote value that a teacher added or subtracted um, to that kid's education. And so there are several ways of doing this. Um, <coughs> excuse me, there are several formulas. Um, but like with any kind of statistical analysis, it gets better even the more the data points you have. And so we try to figure out you know, what is the most um, defensible and accurate way to roll this out. So we decided for elementary school um, teachers to have a baseline of 60 students, which you know, everyone says is pretty conservative. But that one that changes, you know, from, depending on which, um, which district or which state is using. A lot of the uh, debate nationally over the quality of teachers is being driven by uh, the Obama administration and in part race to the top, his race to the top legislation. And I hazard to guess the, the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind, which will be renamed, uh, it will go back to its original name, the Elementary uh, and Secondary Education Act, ESEA, which was created by President Johnson 40, 50 years ago um, <clears throat> as a way to help guide uh, public education in this country. And it's been revised many times. This is a very good Q&A uh, that elaborates on what Jason just talked about. Uh, I would invite all of you to look at it. I think one of the uh, one of the questions in here actually acknowledges that this is a fairly limited way of um, judging teacher quality. But absent anything else, this is what we have now uh, that many states, uh, Jason, you told me before we, we came down here, are beginning to use, partly pressed by the federal government. Do you see anything uh, in, in your, the reporting that you've done, the year-long investigation, anything on the horizon that will provide uh, broader measures for uh, teaching quality in classrooms? Anything that's percolating out there in terms of um, advances? In, this has been tremendously complicated and controversial, as you know, for many, many years. Uh, it helps to understand the way schools are currently evaluated, because value-added is a kind of a new approach. Um, uh, but it helps to understand the kind of limitations of the current approach. So the federal No Child Left Behind law right now grades schools on how um, high uh, their students achieve. So uh, 
What we know from years of research is that students who start off life with a lot of benefits, kids who come from wealthy communities, um, start schools higher achievers than poor kids. And that gain that they have from having all this help and robust preschool and lots of books at home and all that stuff stays with them through life. And so kids from wealthy communities tend to be higher achievers than kids from poor communities. The federal and state in California have the API, right? So schools are measured on the federal and state measures by achievement level. And what does that mean? What that really means is um, that uh, students are essentially being judged by how wealthy or not wealthy their students are in many ways. When you, one of the things we found in this investigation was you go on the Department of Education's website and there's this kind of obscure statistical tables about the API, this, the, you know, the number that you guys all know because it judges whether your school is successful or not. Well, there's a 0.9 correlation between API and the socioeconomics of the kids that go to that school. What does that mean? 81% of differences in APIs are not measuring the quality of the school, it's measuring the socioeconomic background of the kids. So that's the current system, right? Your schools are being judged to a large extent by, how, by the socioeconomics of the kids that go to that school. Value added tries to correct that. And the way it does it is by saying, we're not going to look at achievement levels. We're not going to pay as much attention to how high or low you score. What we're going to look at is, where did you start and where did you end the year? And how much improvement did you make? So poor kids that may have started the year a grade level behind, may make a year and a half worth of growth. And that's remarkable growth. And they may still fall behind the proficiency level, right? But they made huge strides that year. Well, what the growth model would do, what value added would do is would, would say, that's good progress. You're doing a great job because you made incredible strides even though you started behind. Under the current system, that would be considered a failure because no matter how much progress you made, you didn't hit the line that we wanted you to hit. So what we're seeing across the country is school districts are starting to use a value-added approach to look at growth, not achievement. And the federal government is encouraging a reform to the current No Child Left Behind policy, which will incorporate growth. So there's a problem with only looking at growth, too, right? If you only say, boy, you were five grade levels behind at the beginning of the year, and now you're only three grade levels behind, congratulations. Well, there's a problem with that, because that kid is still way behind where he should be. So what the federal government is, is moving towards is some combination of achievement level, you know, here's a standard that we expect all of you to hit, it's called proficiency, and we're gonna push you to get there, and growth measures. If you're way behind that standard, um, and you're showing a lot of good progress, we're gonna reward that. Right now, this part of it is missing, and all we're doing is saying, you know, No Child Left Behind says, all kids, regardless of their background, must be proficient by 2014. Right? That's not an achievable goal. We all know that, but that's what the law says. So I think what the Obama administration is going to do and what school districts are doing is trying to take in, into account growth. What that's going to do is turn over our understandings of which schools are failing and which schools are succeeding. And our second story in the series, the one, oh, it's on the old page, but uh, the second story in the series, which I would encourage you to read because it affects you guys, is looking at the current system and what it calls failures and looking to see if kids at those schools are growing. And what we're finding is in a lot of our failing schools, kids are making incredible progress. And in some of our really successful schools in wealthy <laughs> suburban communities in the valley, um, uh, for example, um, kids there start really high, but they're actually falling behind year after year. They're not getting a good education. And you don't see that with the current system, but what we're trying to show people is that with a value-added approach, looking at schools, you can identify success where we thought there was failure, and vice versa. Some successes are, are actually not as, as, as successful as we thought they were. So it's a new approach to looking at, at what works in public education, and I think you're going to start to see it across the country. And, and I think what's controversial about what we did was using that to evaluate individual teachers. But if you talk to experts, there's a, there's a broad consensus that value added at school level is both robust and an important uh, correction to what is now a very unfair accountability.